Good evening, everyone. That's six o'clock, um, so I will begin the session. My name is Greg Wolverson. I'm the um, substitute stand-in chair uh, this evening uh, for Gary Johnson and um, for the Ahmed so um, Scottish Centre. Um, we've got some slides rolling here that give you some of the details that I'll just overview in uh, one second. Um, this is a free event, um, but we welcome um, any members to join and you can find all the details on the Armets website there that's um, being shown. Um, a quick note on the talk, our talks are being recorded and will be available on YouTube in the next few days, pending release permission um, granted by the speaker. Uh, once we um, begin the talk, there's a whiteboard on your screen. Please ask any questions that you may have by typing them into the whiteboard and the speaker will answer as many as possible after the talk. And I'm uh, being given Prior warning that uh, we might have some good time for that. So that'd be um, good to have an interact, uh, interactive session at the end. Uh, if you do have a question relating to a specific slide, then please note the slide title or number and we can bring it back up on screen during the Q&A. So I will, um, it gives me pleasure to make the introductions for tonight's um, session. Uh, we give a warm welcome to Professor Helen Dacker from the University of uh, Reading. Uh, Helen Dacre is a professor of dynamical meteorology at the University of Reading. Her research focuses on the development of extratropical cyclones, pollution transport through the atmosphere and volcanic ash dispersion. Her cyclone tracking algorithms are in widespread oper operational use and her volcanic ash dispersion model is central to the Met Office aviation safety forecasts. Helen's work on modeling and predicting the path of the Icelandic volcano, Helen can pronounce that in much more detail later. Uh, Ash Plume was pivotal in the reopening of the European airspace in a timely manner. Uh, and also of note, Helen has previously represented Great Britain in water polo at the European Commonwealth and World Championships. So the talk tonight um, is titled A Review of Extratropical Cyclones, Observations and Conceptual Models Over the Past 100 Years. And the summary is that it's um, over 100 years since the publication of uh, Jacob Bjorkner's seminal paper of 1919, on the structure of moving cyclones. The synoptic analysis methods developed in this paper have been applied by national operational weather services worldwide, and the theoretical implementation of cyclogenesis has led to much scientific research. Over the following century, new observing systems and advances in, in computational capabilities have enabled scientific research, which has greatly expanded and enriched our knowledge of extratropical cyclone structure and evolution. In this talk, Professor, Professor Dacre will describe the work by Bjorkness and review the research into extratropical cyclones that has followed. Well, and with no further ado, hand over to yourself, Professor Decker. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Um, I will attempt to share my slides so that I can see them. Okay. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for, for that really nice introduction and for the invitation to, to talk at the um, Scottish Royal Met Sock Centre. Um, as, as Greg was saying, my name is Helen Dacre. I work at the, the University of Reading. And my presentation this evening is going to be a review of extratropical cyclones, focusing on observations and conceptual models over the last um, 100 years. So the material that I am going to present this evening um, was um, put together as part of a paper, which I published in Weather, in, in 2020 on this topic. And the motivation for, for doing the, the work was that it was um, 100 years um, since the publication of a really seminal paper in, in synoptic meteorology. So this is the Bjerknes 1919 paper, which I, um, you can see here. Um, so this paper was called On the Structure of Moving Cyclones and it included this um, really um, iconic um, schematic, which I'm going to describe um, a little bit um, later. So, so what am I going to talk about? Well, I'm going to start by talking about um, the Bjerknes 1919 paper, but I'm also going to try and attempt to um, describe the um, advances the major scientific advances that have been made in extratropical cycling research over the succeeding 100 years. Now, I realize that this is, is quite an ambitious uh, challenge in, in half an hour or so, 
Um, so what I have did, what I did for the for the paper was to um, pick out some um, highlight papers, which I think really um, made some big strides in, in terms of our understanding of extropical cyclone structure and evolution. Um, so I've chosen eight papers and I chose them predominantly because I think they include either a really nice um, schematic which synthesizes the, the advances in the understanding or a really nice plot which um, kind of contains a lot of information um, about um, how we've progressed over that 100 years. Um, so you can see from this timeline that I didn't do this on purpose, but roughly these papers fell about once a decade, um, which is quite interesting. And, and maybe it tells us something about the rate of, of scientific advance um, in, this, in this field of synoptic meteorology. Um, each of these papers really um, coincides with an advancement in our observational capabilities. And then um, towards the towards more modern days in terms of uh, advances in our um, numerical weather prediction capabilities. So they really go hand in hand with observation and numerical modeling capabilities. Um, if you were to do this exercise, I'm pretty sure you would come up with a different set of papers. Um, so we can um, discuss that later um, in the Q&A if you want. Um, but this is my, my take on, on the last 100 years. Um, you'll also notice that um, the timeline ends in about 2000. Um, that, was, that was deliberate. Um, I chose not to um, highlight more recent papers. Um, a lot of my colleagues are very active in this um, area and I didn't want to disappoint anyone by not choosing their paper. Um, to highlight over the last 20 years. So I'm a bit of a chicken and I, um, yeah, I, uh, I stopped in, in the year 2000 because there's been lots of fantastic work since then, of course. Okay, um, so let's start um, in, the, in that 1919 paper and the, and the subsequent papers in the 1920s. So back in the 1920s, the, the Bergen School of Meteorology in Norway um, was um, formed and their aim was to understand the structure and the evolution of extratropical cyclones. Um, and what they did is they made use of um, the European Telegraph Network. So this was um, a network which was all across um, Europe um, and it was a way of getting uh, information about um, wind speed, pressures, and temperatures over a, over a wide uh, continental scale um, for the first time. So prior to this, um, obviously there'd been lots of work in meteorology, but it had mainly been focused either on individual station data or maybe on a, a countrywide um, network. So the, the Bergen meteorologists really um, made use of this you know, European continental scale network which when you're studying something like extratropical cyclones is, is very important because extratropical cyclones also span um, a continental scale. So this paper um, published by Jacob Bjergnes in 1919 um, identified um, some of the main features which are, are common to extratropical cyclones and will be familiar um, to you today, hopefully. Um, so on the left-hand side here is that schematic um, that I showed on the first slide. The, the top panel shows a plan view of an extratropical cyclone and the, the bottom panel shows um, a vertical cross section along this um, line here, this southern section. So what you can see are the familiar positions of um, um, the cold front and the warm front, although in this paper they called them the, the squall line and the steering line. Um, they also um, identified the position of um, clouds associated with these frontal features, and that's shown in the grey shading here. And finally, they identified um, the regions of heaviest precipitation. So that's shown here, um, I just highlighted it in blue, um, along the, the cold front and the warm front. And um, 
the reason I chose this, this paper was because, not because it was necessarily the first paper to identify these features and relate them to extropical cyclones. Um, you could argue, and rightly so, that there were lots of papers before this um, that had identified these features. But I think really it's the, it's, it's the ability of the, the Bergen School and the Norwegian meteorologists to, to synthesize the information and present it and communicate it in a way which is very easily accessible um, by this really nice um, conceptual model. So this um, paper was based almost entirely on um, surface observations. But it stood the test of time and um, the, the Norwegian cyclone model is still used to train forecasters and our undergraduates um, today. So it's, it's had a, a long life. So if we move on a little bit into the, into the 1930s, um, then meteorologists started to think about what was happening above the surface. So although in principle that um, Norwegian model was, was 3D, because um, we looked at that vertical cross section, it was based on um, an inference from surface observations. But in the 1930s, meteorologists started to instrument um, kites and also um, put instruments um, on, on balloons and send them up through, through the atmosphere to get an idea about the 3D um, structure. So um, they, they confirm the, the three-dimensional nature of, of extropical cyclones that was um, hypothesized by the, the Norwegian school in the Björkens paper. So the second paper I've chosen is by Parman in 1931. And the, the plot that I'm showing is a vertical cross-section through an extratropical cyclone. Um, you can see the location of the, of the sloping cold front and the warm front here, which is uh, reminiscent of that um, schematic in the 1919 paper. The, the black contours here are um, constant temperature um, isotherms. So what um, the Parman paper looked at was um, the, the, the location, the, the asymmetric thermal structure of extratropical cyclones. And he identified um, that behind the cold front of an extratropical cyclone, the, the tropopause, which is the boundary between um, the troposphere and the stratosphere, um, had a very low height, um, which is known as a trough behind cold fronts. And ahead of the surface cyclone, um, the tropopause height was warm, um, was cold, sorry, and um, elevated. So this is known as a ridge. So this kind of thermal asymmetry was seen for the first time in this Palmer um, 1931 paper. So they quantitatively um, identified the, the, the upper level trough and the upper level ridge associated with, with extratropical cyclones as a result of these um, vertical profiles that they were taking um, using balloon-borne instruments. So we reach a stage um, in the 1940s where we have a good idea about the, the vertical structure of extratropical cyclones, um, the locations of cold fronts and warm fronts and the precipitation, but there was no real clear understanding of why extratropical cyclones go through their characteristic life cycle. So why do they develop, um, reach maturity, and then decay? Why don't they just keep developing um, continuously and get deeper and deeper? So in the 1940s, um, meteorologists um, set out to try and answer this question. Um, so again, they, they made use of um, more routine radio sound observations to get a handle on the, um, what was going on at upper levels. So I picked another paper from the, from the uh, Bergen School um, from 1944. Um, on the top uh, panel here, we have, again, a plan view of, of the extratropical cyclone. The solid lines are the upper level uh, geopotential height contours, and the dashed lines are the surface mean sea level pressure contours. And um, because they were looking at lots and lots of cyclones, they could identify uh, common features. 
associated with those cyclones. So what they found consistent um, with the, the Palmer paper was that um, at upper levels, there was this trough um, shaped feature, which was occurring um, behind the, the surface cyclone. So they confirmed the, the vertical structure of, of the cyclone, but they also discovered that um, ahead of this upper level trough, there was a region of, of divergence. Um, so whenever we have divergence, then we've got air leaving the column. Um, and if the um, amount of air diverging from a column is greater than the amount of air converging uh, at the surface, um, then the, the pressure at the surface is going to decrease and your cyclone will, will deepen. So they discovered that in the developing phase of extratropical um, cyclogenesis, um, there is this region of, of divergence, uh, which was directly um, above the, the mean sea level pressure center. So we've got air leaving the column, resulting in a, in a deepening of the, of the cyclone. Um, and as a result, um, it, this um, in the vertical, there is a, a westward tilt with height between the location of the surface cyclone and the location of the upper level um, trough axis. So whenever we have a um, divergence, then we have um, ascent. And what they discovered in this Bjergnes and Hombo paper was that the divergence was largest when vertical wind shear in the atmosphere was largest. And this is known as a, a baroclinic um, environment. So the atmosphere is out of balance um, and extratropical cyclogenesis occurs to try and uh, bring the atmosphere back into into balance by generating a mixing of, of the temperature gradients. So essentially what this paper did that was, was really new was that it changed the view of extratropical cyclone development from one of a, a, perturb a growing perturbation on a surface um, front to one in which the, there is an interaction between what's going on at upper levels and what's going on at, at low levels. And the mutual intensification of upper and lower level features results in the, in the development of the cyclone. Um, of course, when the cyclone um, reaches maturity, then this um, region of divergence um, is no longer to the west of the, of, the, of the region of convergence. They become vertically aligned um, and therefore you no longer get any deepening of your, of your cyclone and it starts to, starts to fill and, um, and decay. So now we've got a, a picture of um, the structure of an extropical cyclone and also some, um, some understanding of why cyclones um, develop in, in dry atmospheres. So the next major advancement, I think, in terms of understanding extropical cyclones um, came, um, the next, um, development came in the 1950s um, after the end of World War II and there was a real uh, big increase in the sharing of worldwide observations and I believe this is actually still one of the uh, major strengths of meteorology today is the sharing of data and observations which allow us to have um, a good understanding of the current state of the atmosphere so that we can initialize our numerical weather prediction models and make accurate forecasts. So, as I said, um, after the end of World War II, there was greater sharing of observations. And um, on the right hand side here, we've got um, manually analyzed synoptic charts. So this sharing of observations allowed these synoptic charts to be um, hand drawn every single day, which um, was used by uh, Pettersson in his 1956 paper. So what Pettersson did is he gathered together all of this information from all of these daily analysis of mean sea level pressure, and he created um, the first climatology of extratropical cyclone development. So the figure on the left here is, is out of that 1956 paper. Um, what you're looking at is um, the Northern hemisphere. So you're looking down um, on the North Pole and um, the contours show the, the number of cyclones per day um, 
in the Northern Hemisphere. So just to orientate you, I've put the location of the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean on here. So you won't be able to see the numbers, but if I, if I draw on some contours where the um, frequency of cyclogenesis is high, then we can see, we can pick out the major storm tracks. So you can see that there is a high number of cyclones occurring in the Pacific Ocean, a high number of cyclones occurring in the Atlantic Ocean, and also a smaller, um, slightly weaker storm track in the, in the Mediterranean there. So the real um, kind of um, new knowledge that was um, identified in this climatology was that cyclones aren't evenly distributed. They're not uniform. There are preferred regions for cyclogenesis. And um, as you can see, those preferred regions were um, identified to be over the ocean basins. So this really suggests that, that moisture is going to be important um, for extratropical cyclones. There's also some um, higher um, frequencies of cyclone occurrence downstream of the major mountain ranges as well. So that was, that was um, the, the kind of major advance that was made by creating climatologies was this idea that there are preferred regions of cyclogenesis, they don't happen everywhere. So um, then we go on to the, the 1960s, and this was a little bit of an unexpected bonus, I suppose, for meteorologists, although, um, yeah. So, so what happened in the 1960s is that there, there was a lot of atomic weapons testing, and um, there were concerns um, that the radioactive material that was released into the um, upper part of the tropopause um, could, um, via um, descending air motions, find its way down to the surface. Um, so there was a lot, um, there was an increased number of upper air observations, particularly um, by research aircraft um, observations in the US. And um, De Nielsen made really good use of these extra research aircraft observations to analyze the um, ascending and descending motions around extratropical cyclones. Um, so in his 1964 paper, um, he produced this uh, really nice three-dimensional schematic. This is probably my favorite uh, schematic out of the papers that I, that I reviewed. So what we're looking at here is a, a three-dimensional um, picture of the atmosphere. Um, obviously here we've got the cold front and the warm front and an occluded front at the surface. Um, but what Danielson um, identified was a, a descending airflow which um, came from the upper troposphere, lower stratosphere, and it descended down towards the surface behind um, the surface cold front. And as this descending airflow reached the surface, it split into two branches. One of these branches turned um, anticyclonically away from the cyclone center, and the other branch at a slightly um, higher elevation turned cyclonically into the center of the cyclone. Now, of course, this was a, a problem because it could bring down uh, radioactive material to the surface, but from a meteorological point of view, in terms of understanding extratropical cyclones, it was also bringing down very dry air from the upper troposphere, lower stratosphere, right down to the surface and into the center of, of extratropical cyclones. So this yellow um, descending airflow that I've shown in yellow arrows here is known as the, the dry intrusion or a stratospheric intrusion. And um, so De Nielsen you know, showed that the, that the lack of clouds in, in a region of the cyclone, which is known as the dry slot, um, was the direct result of this dry air descending down from the upper troposphere into the center of the cyclones. So he identified this prior to the widespread um, observation of extratropical cyclones by satellites. So once we got into the 1970s, then, then the availability um, of, of information and data um, from, from satellites became more routine and also from um, ground-based radar as well. So um, as well as identifying the descending airflow, which was responsible for the, for the, for the cloud-free air in the center of the cyclone here, um, meteorologists started to um, want to know what was causing um, the, the formation of clouds around extratropical cyclones. So by looking at lots and lots of satellite images, 
um, it was possible to identify the main, the main cloud features. So I've just named them on here. So we've got um, in this kind of circular cutout centered on, the, on an extratropical cyclone, we have um, a, a band of cloud which runs roughly parallel to the cold front here. So that's the, the frontal cloud band. Then we have um, a, a cloud um, which wraps cyclonically around the, the low pressure center. So this is known as the cloud head. Um, we also have some um, um, upper level cloud, some cirrus cloud here, which is turning anti-cyclonically away from the center of the cyclone. So this is known as the cloud shield. Um, in the middle of the cyclone, we have this dry slot, which I've already um, described. And then quite often behind the cold front where we've got um, cold um, air moving equatorwards over relatively warm sea surface temperatures, we can have convective instability and kind of shallow um, convective clouds forming. So if I just draw on the position of that um, descending um, dry intrusion, we can see that it's responsible for bringing dry air right down into the center of the cyclone. But what's responsible for the, for the formation of this comma-shaped um, cloud wrapping around the cyclone center? So um, a lot of meteorologists uh, were working on understanding the formation of these clouds. And um, one meteorologist who was at the forefront of this um, was uh, Keith Browning. Um, so I was very fortunate to work with Keith Browning at the start of my time in, in Reading. Um, and Keith was interested in, in identifying the ascending airflows which were responsible for the formation of these clouds. So when air ascends, obviously any moisture in it uh, will condense out to form clouds and then precipitation. So Keith and others identified um, an ascending airflow, which I've shown here in the cyan arrows, which is known as the, as the warm conveyor belt. And the figure on the left is a, um, is a schematic from his 1971 paper. So again, the top panel is a plan view of the exotropical cyclone, and the bottom panel is a vertical cross section um, through this cold front, through the warm sector, and then through the, through the warm front. So in, in blue here, I'm showing the, the location of, of this ascending airflow, which is known as the warm conveyor belt. So you can see that it, it, it's, um, it's in the warm sector, so between the cold front and the warm front, and it's running roughly parallel to, to, the, to the cold front. And as the air is ascending, it's forming this frontal cloud band. In the vertical cross section, you can see that it ascends out of the, the boundary layer in the warm sector, up over the warm front. And then in the plan view, we can see that that airflow um, can turn anticyclonically away from the cyclone center. So we've got air ascending and forming cloud turning anticyclonically, and that's going to be responsible for the formation of this upper level um, cirrus shield. Um, subsequent later work also showed that there is another branch to the, to the warm conveyor belt, which turns um, cyclonically around um, the low pressure center and was responsible for the, for the upper level part of that, that, um, that cloud head. So really um, confirming the work of, of De Nielsen and then extending it to, to think about moist ascending airflows around extratropical cyclones. So um, the next kind of um, big, big step in understanding extratropical cyclones, I guess, was a, a renewed interest in the role of moist processes. Um, so in the 1980s, um, Sanders and Geichen were investigating um, explosive cyclogenesis. So cyclogenesis is the um, development of exotropical cyclones. And they were identifying cyclones which deepened really rapidly. Um, and these became known colloquially as, as bombs. Um, so um, cyclones which are deepening by more than uh, 24 millibars in 24 hours um, at 60 North are defined as as, as bombs. So they produced the, um, the first climatology just based on a, a few years worth of data to begin with, um, where they were identifying where this explosive cyclogenesis was occurring. Um, and again, we're in the Northern hemisphere as much of the research is actually on exotropical cyclones. 
um, looking down at the North Pole and just showing the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. Um, and you can see that the explosive cyclogenesis, again, was preferentially occurring over the oceans um, rather than over the continents, which um, suggests that the um, diabatic processes, the role of moisture was is important for um, explosive cyclogenesis in particular. Um, so this is this is still a really active area of research in meteorology today, understanding how uh, latent heat release in those ascending airflows can enhance extratropical um, cyclogenesis and lead to um, bomb cyclones. So once we got um, into the 1990s, then um, the focus really shifted to, to smaller and smaller scale features associated with extratropical cyclones. So we had a good idea about the fronts and the clouds and these uh, synoptic scale airflows. But um, meteorologists started to look at more mesoscale features, so of the order 100 kilometers um, or less. And um, Shapiro and Kaiser in their 1990 paper were looking at the, the frontal structure um, and the thermal structure of a whole climatology of exotropical cyclones. And they found that many of the cyclones that they analyzed were not consistent with the Norwegian um, model of um, exotropical cyclone development. Um, so this is a, a figure from their 1990 paper. Um, on the top, we have um, the four stages of exotropical cyclone development. So stage one is the initiation phase, and then we have um, the developing and the, the mature phase. So initially in this very early stage, um, it looks like a Norwegian cyclone. It has a cold front and it has a warm front, and the gray shading here shows the location of the, the precipitation. But when we get to phase two, it starts to differ from the Norwegian model. Um, in, in these Shapiro-Kaiser type cyclones, the cold front becomes dislocated um, from the warm front. So it separates um, from the warm front uh, in a process known as frontal fracture. So it becomes fractured. Um, and then the cold front can move perpendicular relative to the warm front away from the cyclone center. And the warm front uh, wraps around the cyclone center and remains uh, very strong. Um, and this is, this is different to a Norwegian cyclone where the warm front tends to weaken and the cold front remains very strong. And as that warm air, um, as that warm front wraps around the cyclone center, then cold air gets brought into the center of the cyclone and surrounds a region of warmer air, which is known as a warm seclusion. And this is not identified in, in the Norwegian um, cyclone model. So they came up with this, um, this new um, conceptual model for extratropical cyclone development. And I guess the main point here was to, to show that when you actually dig into the detail of extratropical cyclones, they're all quite different. Um, extratropical cyclones cover a very broad spectrum um, of, of structure and evolution types. Um, and so no one conceptual model can really describe all cyclone evolution. Uh, when you get into to looking at the, um, the details of extratropical cyclone development. Um, so that's kind of where we are now, looking at the, the details of individual cyclones and the differences um, between them. So this brings me on to, I guess, current day, or as close to current day as I dare go, um, so the 2000s and onwards. Um, so in the last 20 years, um, computational modeling has, has really increased uh, in terms of the resolution and our ability to uh, identify these mesoscale features. Um, observations have been really outpaced um, by the theory. And um, on a daily basis, we, we analyze um, extratropical cyclones and we see that these mesoscale structures can play a role in the development of the extropical cyclones. Um, it can be quite difficult to take observations of these mesoscale features. Um, field campaigns are very expensive. Um, and so via modeling, um, there has been um, a kind of explosion, I suppose, in terms of the conceptual models around exotropical cyclones. 
So we start to identify smaller scale features such as um, sting jets, um, frontal seclusions, and we start to think about how cyclones are linked together via cyclone clustering. Um, there are features known as atmospheric rivers. We've got polar lows, which are cyclones which are forming at high latitudes. So you can see that there's a whole um, there's a whole kind of jigsaw here of, of new conceptual models which have exploded since we've got um, very high resolution NWP um, modeling. Now each of these model, each of these conceptual models should fit together, um, but sometimes it can be a little bit tricky to um, to, to, to relate one to the other. So we really need to work hard now to, to try and link these different conceptual models together um, to understand how they're, how they're related. So um, that's what I have to say. Um, in summary, I will say that since 1919, um, there has been an awful lot of work in understanding cyclone structure and evolution. Um, we, know, we know a lot more about why cyclones develop, um, but there's still an awful lot of exciting research to do. Um, I was having a little bit of a think about what are the what are the current you know areas of research that people are looking at. Um, firstly, it's these mesoscale features, so um, you know features like sting jets occurring and their their impacts and whether we can um, explicitly resolve them and um, and how they might change in the future. Um, the role of moist processes in um, generating ex extreme and intense precipitation. Um, there's quite a lot of research going on looking at the coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean, and also even you know, um, the role of um, atmospheric chemistry in terms of um, extropical cyclone development. And then, you know, the big question really is, is how, how are these um, systems going to change in the future? Are they going to become more intense, less intense, more frequent? Um, you know, um, how, how's that going to, how's that going to pan out? So these are, these are really um, open-ended questions at the moment and, and it's a good thing. So it gives me lots of things to, to research in the future. Um, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Dacre. As we discussed before, it's always very difficult to, um, to a virtual blank crowd, but uh, I was intently listening and uh, it was a really clear and informative presentation. So thank you very much indeed for that. Um, yeah, I've been making all my notes as well. Uh, good revision <laughs> for myself going through all that. Um, yeah, I mean, my questions initially, we'll, we'll let some questions um, come into the chat. Uh, really was based around that idea of just as you sort of summarized at the end there of uh, looking forward how do you sort of bring all those different strands together um, uh, and and where does it go from here I guess a huge amount of data now to analyze um, so yeah I mean you summarized it well I mean I, I, the big question is always around climate change and whether that will have any or what influence that may have on mesoscale um, systems like this I don't know if there's any there's no simple answer to that, but any, any, any thoughts initially on that? Well, I mean, so, so there's still a lot of uncertainty in the climate projections about, you know, even, even the location of the storm tracks, if they're going to shift, if they're going to move more polewards, if they're going to extend into Europe. And, you know, most of the research at the moment is in understanding what's causing that uncertainty in our climate models. Why are they not all giving us the same answer uh, when we give them the same forcing? You know, is that to do with the fact that we are, um, you know, we have to run climate models at fairly coarse resolution because of the numerical, you know, the computation expense of running for hundreds of years? You know, is it because some of the processes which are important for, you know, predicting the intensity and the, and the frequency of cyclones are very small scale, like these diabatic processes? Um, or are there other reasons why, you know, um, we have a, a range, is it to do with the interaction between the stratosphere and the, trop uh, the troposphere, for example, um, or the underlying ocean. So there's a lot of kind of work to try and understand what's going to happen in the future. Oh, here we go. There's one for Martin Young. Uh, Martin asks, have you done theoretical studies of the common complex systems that involve interaction between smaller scale, cold air, semi-baroclinic features and the broader scale frontal zones? 
these can be very volatile in terms of model predictability, even less than 36 hours ahead. Well, I'm not sure I entirely understand the question. So is the question about secondary cyclogenesis? So um, instabilities that can form on the cold front of extratropical cyclones, um, which I agree there is less predictability. Um, they tend to be um, smaller scale, so um, they're harder to predict. They tend to develop um, more explosively. Um, and also they tend to form in the kind of mid to East Atlantic where we have um, fewer observations. Um, yeah, Martin's confirmed um, to sort of summarize, thinking about the interaction between, for example, PVAs and frontal zones. Um, so as you answered there, I think. Cool. Thank you. Um, so the second question is, um, this story has evolved by better understanding the 3D um, and time ID 4D structure of the atmosphere. Are any particular improvements in visualization and data synthesis helping you at all? So I think the answer to that question is, is twofold. Um, there has been a lot of investment in um, kind of three-dimensional visualization. So you can use computer graphics to um, allow you to um, visualize the data in 3D and walk around the data as it were. Um, and that is a very useful tool for understanding um, how features like tropopause folds descend and interact with, with the surface. And you can then animate those and you can kind of see how the systems are, are developing. The difficulty I find with using kind of three-dimensional visualization in that way is that you tend to um, look at individual cases. So you'll look at a single case in a huge amount of detail um, in this kind of you know, three-dimensional visualization. Um, and that can tell you a lot about that system <laughs> in that particular storm and what's important for the development of that storm. When it comes to being more general, then you can't really use that three-dimensional structure, uh, that three-dimensional visualization to, to understand how the systems are developing more generally. So that's when you kind of have to resort back to kind of compositing or, or you know, synthesizing the information, um, which is you know, best done. Um, in, in 2D because you need to combine lots of data together um, to understand the structure in that way. So yes and no, I, it also depends on your computation, on your kind of programming uh, um, proficiency as to how, how good you are at doing that. Um, so I like to look at animations, so that's the time element, and I like to look at the three-dimensional uh, visualization. Um, but yeah, there's limitations to what you can you can do with that. Perfect, thank you. I hope you're sitting comfortably. Helen, we've got plenty of questions coming in now, which is excellent. Um, Vicky Ingham asks an interesting question. Are there particular areas of the world where we need more observations to better refine the models? What do these observations need to be? Well, I can give you one particular example. Um, so we, have not have really focused on what's going on in the northern hemisphere um, quite a lot, <laughs> um, you know, um, in terms of the uh, field campaigns that are done um, and um, you know, southern hemisphere cyclones are are developing by the same mechanisms, but I think it would be um, you know wise for us to to shift our attention a little bit um, to understand what's going on um, in the Southern Hemisphere in terms of the storm tracks. There are some questions which we don't even know the answers to, like um, in the Northern Hemisphere, we've done a lot of work looking at something called cyclone clustering. So this is when you get multiple cyclones um, forming families, and um, then you get uh, one cyclone after another coming over the same location, which can lead to, um, you know, um, an accumulation of the hazard. 
um, and, and, and flooding. We've experienced that in the UK um, quite recently. Um, now, we don't really have a good understanding of, of how, how much cyclone clustering there is in the Southern Hemisphere, for example. And because of the different um, amount of land mass in the Southern Hemisphere, it may be that cyclone clustering is, is more frequent in the Southern Hemisphere uh, and very important for um, Antarctic um, ice um, formation. So I think definitely, you know, changing our, our focus from the Northern Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere would be a good idea. And um, I guess the other thing I would say on that is, um, you know, field campaigns are expensive, but they can be hugely valuable for evaluating our models. So we've put a lot of effort into going to higher and higher resolution, coupling our models to the ocean, to the waves. Um, but in terms of validating that coupling or validating the mesoscale structures, which we're able to identify in these high resolution models, we have to go out there and take those measurements. So there is, there's, there's still a really important need to maybe go out and look at the mesoscale structures associated with cyclones, surface fluxes to validate the coupling with the ocean um, and that kind of thing. So, so um, yeah, I think, I think there's definite areas that we could, we could put our money into observations better. Thank you, that's a really interesting insight. We've got another question from Dan Surrey. Dan's given me a lot to read out, but that's fine. It's a shame we can't have the direct interaction. Um, you do this yeah. in person, but uh, it's good that we've got a wide audience though as well. Um, Dan says, great presentation, and that he really enjoyed it. Um, Dan talks about how it amazes me how without the benefit of NWP and satellite imagery, um, that the early studies are able to construct a model that still works so well. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you know Dan, Dan, I know Dan is a, a chief um, meteorologist at the Met Office. And he says, sometimes on shift at the Met Office, I wonder what Berkness would think if he wandered in and started to watch what I do. Uh, drawing up charts would perhaps be one thing he'd recognize and I wonder what he'd think. Would he be pleased his work has stood the test of time? Would, be, would he be amazed at what additional elements we've discovered and learned about extratropical cyclones? And was he aware of any of this very empirically in the way that say Gronus? talks about Norwegian forecasters talking about the poisonous sting in the tail of cyclones in the 1960s. So I guess the final question then, would he be disappointed about any elements of how his work is used? Well, I can't answer that. I can't answer that. <laughs> Can I? But, I mean, I, I also find it amazing that, you know, um, the Norwegian, the Norwegian um, school was able to you know, take really quite sparse information and infer something about um, the general features of extratropical cyclones. We all know when we look at observations that they're noisy, they're messy, you know, there's errors in the observations, there's, you know, idiosyncrasies to do with the sighting and, and all this, you know, kind of, you know, really important stuff. And it's, it's amazing that you can, that, the meteorologists are capable of, of looking at that very noisy data, um, analyzing it in huge amounts of detail, filtering out essentially the, the important salient common features and, and then, you know, drawing simple pictures which allow forecasters like Dan um, every day to use them, have them in their heads so that when they look at complex information now from numerical weather prediction models, but all, with all the noise that you would get from an observation because they're such high resolution and say, no, hang on, I, although there's lots of complexity here, I can still recognize, you know, these airflows around exotropical cyclones. I can still understand what's causing, you know, um, this cold front to, to form and, and to develop. So, so I, I agree. I think it's, it's amazing that these, these kind of models have stood, stood the test of time. Would he be amazed at the, you know, the identification of smaller and smaller scale features? I mean, I don't know. Is that not an inevitable advance of science? We understand the big picture and then we, we try and drill into to, to the differences between instead of the similarities, that's what we try and do, right? We try and we try and say, why are things similar? And then once we've worked that out, we try and say, why are they different? Um, so, you know, predicting the sting at the end of a tail 
um, again, you know, the, the genius of, of Keith Browning to be able to identify that um, mesoscale feature from radar imagery, um, you know, which is again, noisy because it's near the surface and it's, it's messy data, but um, yeah, I, I think that's uh, something we all, we all struggle with today, but I, I hope you would be pleased <laughs> with, the, with the way that, you know, the research has progressed. Um, it's been fairly, you know, steady through the hundred years. Um, I think, I think what he would might be most impressed with is our ability to predict, you know, you know, three days, five days, seven days in advance, some really small scale, high impact weather that we can actually produce forecasts, which people can make decisions on reliably, um, take action to prevent loss of life and damage. And, and I think that's what he'd be most impressed with. Because although they understood the structure of the cyclones, predicting when they were gonna occur, <laughs> um, that's a different question and something that, that's, that's come fairly recently. Great answer, thank you. Um, so this is a bit more of a detailed um, return to the sort of climate change topic that I touched on at the beginning. Um, Roy Thompson asks, a long time ago, it was realized that global warming would reduce the equator to pole thermal gradient and hence extratropical winds might be expected to decrease. And yet more recently, increased storm, and, and yet more recently, increased storminess is favored, at least by the UK media, with climate change. Any views? Well, I mean, so, so I tried to point out that, you know, um, the formation and the development of cyclones is, is not only what's going on at the surface. <laughs> so yes, you know, the, the, the pole to equator temperature gradient is changing, but it's also changing at upper levels as well. So we've got this kind of, you know, uh, fight between what's going on at upper levels and what's going on at low levels. And that makes it difficult to say, you know, just, um, you know, even the sign of, of the change, whether we would expect um, there to be more cyclones or, or fewer, fewer cyclones. Um, I think, um, when you have a, a warmer climate you also have more moisture um, in the in the atmosphere and because we we know that the diabatic processes can influence um, the development of, of some cyclones other cyclones are more baroclinically driven and, and and some cyclones are more diabatically driven again this kind of spectrum of cyclones some cyclones you know are really dependent on how much moisture there is and others aren't then that's an added complication as to whether we think there is going to be more explosive cyclogenesis. So if di diabatic processes are important for that kind of really rapid development, then, then um, predicting whether we're going to get, you know, more explosive cyclones, but fewer, that might be, might be the, the kind of result as a result of climate change. Thank you. And I think that hopefully maybe answers, there was a follow-up question as well uh, related to Roy's question. Maybe we'll see more X hurricanes interact with these systems to create more extreme events. Yeah, so so those kind of tropical cyclones undergoing extratropical transition and then coming across, you know, the North Atlantic um, towards us, they're they're often responsible for for really heavy precipitation. You know, we've all experienced that. Um, you know, I don't think there's any consensus as to whether we would expect to see more. Um, tropical cyclones undergoing extratropical transition um, or interacting with extratropical cyclones and, and causing, um, you know, causing them to develop differently, but there's certainly an area that people are, are looking into. We've got one more question, I think, um, which fits quite nicely, actually, we've got two questions. Well, one I think is possibly related um, to past discussions just there about um, that psychogenesis is primarily associated with the jet stream and in a warming world when the, um, just as we discussed, um, the temp temperature differentials um, are varying. Is it easy to speculate that the jet stream could become a much weaker feature on average, which might have a dramatic effect on the climatology of cyclones? So I think there's, there's two points. One is the strength of the jet stream and one is the location of the jet stream. Um, I don't think either of them are easy um, to predict what's gonna, it's gonna happen. There's some suggestion that the, at least in the North Atlantic, that the jet stream um, may become more 
um, elongated. So, um, you know, um, extend further into uh, Western Europe, which could potentially lead to an increase in the number of cyclones which we experience in the UK. Um, and then in terms of the location, you know, some climate models um, predict that there's going to be a poleward uh, movement of the of the jet stream, which of course would um, tend to steer the cyclones in the North Atlantic further north and therefore reduce the number of cyclones uh, we get in the UK. So I think there's two aspects of the jet stream that we need to understand in order to predict how it's how it's going to change in the future. But yeah, um, you know, like I said, there, there, there's there's some consensus from the models that that's what's going to happen, but there's certainly you know other projections which suggest the opposite. So. Thank you all. This next question is a fun question to end on. Um, and Vicky asks again, um, made for TV movies are somehow both terrible and entertaining, but would it actually be possible to knock a cyclone off course to save a population area? If it's theoretically possible, do we need to start thinking, uh, looking at this, if their tracks and strength change to put more people at greater risk? Well, it's a very interesting idea. Um, I believe that the amount of energy you would need to, to knock a, a cyclone or a tropical cyclone or an extropical cyclone off course is, 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 is massive, <laughs> um, you know, um, so not really feasible. I mean, theoretically, I can understand the argument um, for being able to do that, but, but practically, um, no, I don't think, I think cyclones are here to stay and we just have to uh, predict them and mitigate for their impacts, I'm afraid. But I like the question. <laughs> so, well, I think that uh, ties up nicely with the timings as well. And that's all of our questions. Um, once again, many thanks from, from us uh, for speaking to us. Um, and, and thanks for the, the Q&A as well. That was, that was excellent and, and nice to get that interaction as well. We tried our best virtually. Um, so many thanks again. And I'm sure if we were in person, there'd be a big round of applause as well. So many, many thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, question. I'll also take um indeed yeah, it was it was good questions um i'll take the chance just to thank the um real met sock organizers as well in order to get this um, to work and it's great to bring people across um from across the uk i believe um to, to this session so that's that's fantastic um just to end on a, a short plug on our next sessions um our next session is the final one of this term on the 21st of march which is our regular postgraduate student showcase and we've got two speakers Mr. Daniel Skinner from the University of East Anglia, looking at decadal variability of the extratropical response to the Madden Julian oscillation, alongside Mr. Ned Williams from the University of Exeter, who will be looking at far flung influences on the predictability of the North Atlantic winter climate. And finally, I want to just make a quick mention, and um, this is the Scottish Centre that we're all attending just now, but there will be a national meeting taking place in Scotland, in Edinburgh, on the 22nd of April, um, and that will be um, looking at mountain meteorology um, and its climate change and forecasting perspectives. And that's an in-person event at the Dynamic Earth in Edinburgh. So that promises to be quite an, an enjoyable and interactive session. And that's a Saturday as well. So all details from them will be on the uh, website. So please do take a look. Uh, plenty of thanks coming in, Helen, on, on the chat as well. So um, a very popular and, and appreciated talk. So I think on that, uh, seven o'clock, we'll, we'll call it there. And um, many thanks, Evan, for attending. And thanks again for speaking. <laughs>